and what's up, American History viewers? We have a Chapter 19 review video from Alan Brinkley's book on the docket for you today, From Crisis to Empire. We are going to cover so much information in this chapter, so let's get going. All right, some big ideas that you should think about during the late 19th century, especially when it comes to politics. There's a very high voter turnout. Control of Congress goes back and forth constantly between the Republicans and the Democrats. And when we're talking about Republicans and Democrats, it's important to know who would support each group. And Republicans generally were supported by Northern Protestants, the middle class, and they also favored high tariffs. Remember, Republicans want to raise tariffs. Republican raise, Republican raise, Republican raise. Democrats, on the other hand, tended to be supported by Catholics, immigrants, poor workers, and they wanted low tariffs. Democrats wanted to see the tariffs go down. Democrats down, Democrats down. Republican raise, Democrats down. Democrats down, Republicans raise. So how did the government support economic development during this time period? They did so in many ways, including subsidies to railroads or giving them tax breaks or even lending them money. And they also would use the military to end work stoppages. We saw that a lot in the last chapter that, that virtually all of the time the government sided with employers during strikes. Some key terms to know here, we have stalwarts, and those were Republicans that favored patronage or giving jobs to supporters. The leader of the stalwarts was this guy, Roscoe Conklin, who was a senator. And then half-breeds, these were Republicans that favored reform in the government, and they were led in part by this guy, James Blaine, who was a presidential candidate and secretary of state. Be familiar with both stalwarts and half-breeds. The 20th president of the United States was James A. Garfield, and he was killed by a stalwart. You'll notice here he was shot in the back in Washington, D.C. at a train station. The guy who shot him, when he shot him, said, I am a stalwart, and Chester A. Arthur is now president. James Garfield was not in favor of patronage. My favorite book that I've ever read is called Destiny of the Republic. It is by Candace Miller. I actually have a review up on apushreview.com soon. It's all about the Garfield assassination, one of the most interesting time periods ever. You have a lot of key figures like Roscoe Conklin, like Chester Arthur, like and a few inventors as well. It's pretty cool. I highly recommend you check it out. So we're going to skip over Chester A. Arthur's presidency because not really much happens as far as a push is concerned. But what we do need to know is that in 1883, the Pendleton Act is passed. And this provides for a civil service exam for federal government jobs. So this is a way to limit patronage, the Pendleton Act. And this is passed in response to James Garfield being killed. In 1884, we have a presidential election with Grover Cleveland versus James Blaine. This was a highly contested election. Lots of mudslinging back and forth. Very, very dirty campaign. The Blaine campaign had a slogan for Grover Cleveland. Ma, ma, where's my pa? Because there were allegations that Grover Cleveland fathered a child out of wedlock and did not support this child. So this was a way to kind of taunt Grover Cleveland. Cleveland wins, and he is a laissez-faire president, did not believe that the government should really intervene in the economy at all. And the tariff issue begins to separate Republicans and Democrats, or really is a main separator, I should say. Again, Republicans want to raise the tariff, Democrats want to lower it. In 1890, we have the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is more symbolic than anything else at this time period. It was passed to break up monopolies, but in actuality... You need to know this at all costs. In actuality, it was used to break up unions. The purpose was to break up trusts, but you had some really good lawyers who turned it around to help break up unions. And they did so because part of the Sherman Antitrust Act said that anything that was a restraint to trade could possibly be broken up. And they were, they were able to argue that unions helped restrain trade. Definitely know that it broke up unions. In 1890, with the McKinley Tariff, he was a Republican. So what does this tariff rate do? Yeah, it raises it. And there is William McKinley goes on to become president in 1896. In 1877, we have a court case that the book really does not talk about too well, Munn versus Illinois. And this Supreme Court case says that state governments can regulate industries when it is in the best interest of the public. And this allows them to take a more hands-on approach on regulating industries. This is overturned nine years later by the Wabash case, which says that states cannot regulate interstate commerce. And this overturns the Mun decision. So for a little while, states are able to regulate industries, particularly interstate industries. But in the Wabash case in 1886, the Supreme Court says, nope, can't do that. 
So then we have the Interstate Commerce Act, which created the ICC, and this outlawed higher rates on short hauls than long hauls for railroads. And what that means is, if I live in Buffalo, so if, you're, if I were to take a train to New York City, I would go from Buffalo to Rochester and then on my way to New York City. On the same track, I would take a train from Buffalo to Rochester. Railroad companies could not charge more for the Buffalo to Rochester trip than they could for the Buffalo to New York City trip. And also, railroads must publish their rates. So we're going to see farmers get very upset during this time, and they're going to form a bunch of different organizations, including the Grange, which provided social and economic opportunities for farmers. They hope to end monopolies in railroads, and they wanted government ownership of businesses, especially railroads. The Populist Party will be a big idea in the late 1800s. They absorbed some of the ideas from farmers. You should definitely know the Omaha Platform, which is written by this dude with probably the sweetest name ever, Ignatius. And Ignatius Donnelly favored the following things. Free and unlimited coinage of silver at a ratio of 16 to 1. In other words, 16 ounces of silver would equal 1 ounce of gold. They did this because it would increase the money supply and make it easier to pay off debts, which would help farmers. They also favored a graduated income tax. Government ownership of the telephone and telegraph and railroads. The initiative, referendum, and recall, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, the, the Progressive Era, which gave more power to the voters. And a postal savings bank, a safe repository run by the government. And also they favored limiting government land grants to settlers rather than railroads. They thought the individual should be able to get the land grants, not railroads. And finally, they favored the direct election of senators. Most of these things we will see come true in the next chapter. You see the graduate income tax, you see the initiative referendum and recall, and the direct election of senators. So it's very important to know that some of these populist ideas are absorbed later. In 1893, we have a panic, and who would have guessed it? But one of the causes is over-speculation. We also have a stock market crash and overproduction of goods. It's actually, so what are the results? Well, the government repeals the Sherman Silver Act, which makes it so that silver is not really used to back currency anymore. We have a group of poor people protesting the government policies, and this is called Coxie's Army. And this does appear in the A-Push exam in multiple choice questions, so be familiar with it. So they advocated a public works program. They marched all the way to Washington, D.C., where they were broken up by police. So they had demands to reduce unemployment and get more money for them, and it does not work. Then we have free silver, which is, again, this idea of the populace, is 16 to 1 ratio. And this is something they hope to have that would lead to an increase in the money supply, which once again will help debtors pay off debts. So we have this very famous guy in the late 1800s, William Jennings Bryan. He won the Democratic nomination in 1896, and he was a great orator. And he challenged McKinley, the Republican McKinley, in the election of 1896. I do have a video on the election of 1896. Check it out in the description below. William Jennings Bryan is known for his famous Cross of Gold speech, and just like my political hero Henry Clay, he ran for president three times and lost. Poor guy. And he said, we will ant and this was at the Democratic nomination convention, we will answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. It really energizes the Democratic Party, and he is nominated at age 36, the youngest person ever nominated by a large political party. There he is being carried away on the shoulders of men. And in 1896, this is the first modern campaign. You can find out why by checking out that video. And Bryan advocated lowering the tariff. Again, Democrats want the tariff to go down and also the 16 to 1. However, he does not win. McKinley wins. So now we're going to shift to another idea. We focus mostly on domestic issues in this chapter. Now we're going to go to foreign issues and imperialism. And during this time, the U.S. is going to want to expand overseas. Manifest destiny is complete. So now the U.S. has the entire United States from coast to coast. They're running out of room. So where else can they go? And this idea that the frontier was closed in 1893 with Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis. Arguably... One of the greatest reasons to expand was put forth by Alfred T. Mahan in his book, The Influence of Sea Power. Be able to identify the book, but also be able to just identify his name. I've seen questions before of what was the arguments put forth by Alfred T. Mahan or some variation of that. 
He stated that the control of the sea was important to world dominance. So this urges the United States and other countries as well, as a result of reading this, to build up their navy. So we're going to see a naval raise in the late 1800s. This will be hugely favored by Teddy Roosevelt and other expansionists. Now the U.S. is going to start to look elsewhere, and they're going to focus on the Pacific and Hawaii. Well, Hawaii was attracted to the U.S. because it was it had a lot of sugar production. And since the 1840s, the U.S. had foreign interest in Hawaii. You'll see many American farmers move to Hawaii to produce sugar, and many people in the U.S. will call for the annexation of Hawaii. However, in 1890, the tariff exemption on Hawaii ended. Keep in mind, Hawaii was not a part of the United States at this time. So now, any goods that Hawaii shipped to the United States would be subject to a high tariff. It hurt the farmers that were in Hawaii. So they stage a coup and overthrow Queen Lilu Kalani, and she believed that native Hawaiians should control the islands, not Americans or foreign powers. But she is overthrown in 1893, and the treaty to annex Hawaii was initially rejected by Grover Cleveland. It won't be until McKinley's president that Hawaii joins the Union. Also in 1878, the U.S. sets up a naval station in Samoa in the Pacific as well. So now we're going to get into the Spanish-American War, which I do have a video on as well, so please check that in the description below. And in 1895, Cuba begins to revolt against the Spanish, and they follow a policy called the Scorched Earth Policy, which they basically destroy everything. They destroy all the crops, and they try to hurt Spain economically. The U.S. is very concerned because they have $50 million of investments and $100 million of annual trade with Cuba, so they do not like what's going on there. Also, there's a Spanish general nicknamed Butcher Weiler, and he tried to crush the rebellion. He throws people in barbed wire reconcentration camps. We also have yellow journalism with Hearst and Pulitzer, in which allegedly it was said, you furnish the pictures and I'll finish the war. And this leads the American public to be more aware of what's going on in Cuba. And the Spanish minister spoke negatively about McKinley. He calls him weak in a letter, and this is called the DeLome letter. He's talking smack about McKinley, and a lot of Americans are upset about this. So eventually the United States is going to go to war. The USS Maine is stationed in Cuba, and this mysteriously blows up, killing 260 sailors. And the subsequent pictures was a huge cause for involvement in the war. In February of 1898, you see lots of pictures in the newspaper. You see this, the World newspaper, which was one of the most circulated newspapers of the time. On the front, it says, main explosion caused by bomb or torpedo, question mark. Now, it doesn't really claim that, but you're reading this, you're thinking, wow, it sounds like they, some enemy might have done this. You see the ship blowing up, and somewhere in there you can see people flying. And it really makes the Spanish look bad. This is an example of yellow journalism. On April 11th, 1898, McKinley sends a message to Congress urging war with Spain, and they promised Cuba something in the Teller Amendment that once the Spanish are overthrown, Cubans would gain their freedom. During the fighting which happens in Cuba, we have the Rough Riders led by Teddy Roosevelt in the middle there, Kind of looks like Iron Man the way he's posed. This was a group of volunteers that played a role in the Spanish-American War. And in August 12, 1898, four months later, the armistice was signed that stopped the fighting. During the war, 400 Americans died during battle, yet 5,000 died due to disease. Definitely know that more die from disease than do the battle. So what does America gain as a result of this war? Well, they gain Guam, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, and also the Philippines. And the key issue with the Philippines is what do does the United States do with them? And McKinley said, after having a revelation from, from prayer, that he planned to Christianize and civilize them. Now, if we look at Cuba and Puerto Rico, that's down in the Caribbean, and the Philippines are way over in Asia. So some people are beginning to wonder, why did we gain this land over in Asia when the fighting was really all about Cuba? And some of these people are members of the Anti-Imperialist League. And this is made up by Mark Twain, the presidents of Harvard and Stanford, Samuel Gompers, the leader of the AFL, and Carnegie as well. And some of them argue that didn't the Filipinos deserve the consent of the government just like the United States does. At this time, there's also a very famous poem by Rudyard Kipling, The White Man's Burden, which encouraged imperialism and said it was the duty of the United States to civilize non-Western areas. The Foraker Act of 1900 gave Puerto Ricans limit, a limited degree of popular government. And later, in 1917, they were granted citizenship during the Jones Act. 
Okay, so a question begins here. This is something the book doesn't talk about. Is does the Constitution follow the flag? In other words, does the Constitution protect these people in territories? This is a Supreme Court case known as the Insular Cases. So what the Supreme Court says is that the Constitution does not necessarily apply to new areas. Subjects may be subject to American rule, but they did not enjoy all American rights. So just because the U.S. had a territory does not mean that those people living in the territory had the same rights as American citizens. In 1902, the U.S. withdraws from Cuba, sort of, through something known as the Platt Amendment. And definitely know this. This stated that Cuba can't have treaties with other countries that compromises its independence or goes against the wishes of the United States. The U.S. can intervene to restore order, and Guantanamo Bay is given to the United States. That's why today, in 2014, the U.S. still has Guantanamo Bay. It all goes back to the Platt Amendment. The Philippines thought they would receive independence like Cuba, but they were not included in these peace negotiations, and eventually they do not receive independence. That leads this guy, Emilio Aguinaldo, to want revenge. And he will institute guerrilla warfare in the Philippines, and the U.S. finds himself in another war, and eventually Aguinaldo is captured. So we're going to move over to Asia now and focus on China. Europe established spheres of influence in China. And here's a very famous political cartoon in which European leaders are essentially just carving up China amongst themselves. So the U.S. is afraid that they will miss out on valuable markets in China. So the Secretary of State John Hay establishes what's known as the Open Door Note or the Open Door Policy. And the purpose of this was to ensure that the U.S. would not be locked out of China. This allowed the U.S. to trade in China, even without having a sphere of influence. As a result of these spheres of influence, we have in China a secret society, the Harmonious Fist, also known as the Boxers, which is also called the Boxer Rebellion, and they chant death to foreign devils, and they rebel. And this is eventually broken up by multinational troops or troops from different countries. All right, that's everything you need to know about Chapter 19. Thank you very much for watching. If you have not already, please subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section below, and I will be sure to answer them. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good day, guys.